This morning, would you please open your Bibles to Psalms 100? Might have thrown some of you off right there, huh? What, what? Psalms 100? <clears throat> Meaning we've been in Corinthians for so long, that's what I mean by that. <clears throat> uh, this is our Thanksgiving uh, uh, Sunday. You know, we, we take some time, you know, I was thinking on this. You know, as believers, we should be thankful all the time. Right, and, and I'm one of those that, that has a rule in the in the in the home that there's Christmas nothing until after Thanksgiving. I, was, I don't know if I should hide behind the pulpit on that one. Um, not to say that Christmas isn't important, right? We we understand that as as Christians, Christ, yes, Christmas is is a wonderful time because if Christ didn't come, right, there's no cross. And so it's very important, but I'm, I'm one of those that, that loves Thanksgiving. And uh, I found myself, I say that to say, I've come to this psalm. Psalms 100 is, is five verses, and I, I thought, man, this is a, this is a beautiful, it's a, it's a power-packed little psalm here that we'll, we'll get into here in a moment. Uh, and I was looking at it, and, and uh, by the time I got through the first three verses, I had enough for a sermon already. And I thought, well, I can cram the other ones in, hold them over, That's always, that always goes over good. Right, so we'll just go longer. And I thought, no, you know what? We can we can take two Sundays and cover this psalm because there's wonderful things here that I think are good for us to think upon, to be reminded of, of the goodness of God, of his character, of his heart, and what the psalm calls us to. And so uh, I'd like to look at the first three verses uh, this this Sunday, and uh, next Sunday we'll look at the remaining two. But um, this is a wonderful psalm. It's a wonderful psalm uh, that just very to the point. I don't know if you're one of those people who likes uh, uh, something very succinct and clear. You know, it's not hard to understand where the psalmist is going, but he has wonderful conviction, right, about who God is and what you're supposed to do in response to it. I think that's a, a message the church is, is sometimes has forgotten about, right? We kind of have this tendency to, to pray often and to which is good and commanded, but sometimes we, we go and do this so much we forget who we're actually praying to, right? And He is mighty, He is awesome, He is holy, uh, He is the creator, uh, He is sustainer, right? He sustains us, and we could go on and on and on and on of who God is. And uh, it's amazing to stop and think that, you know, because of God's holiness, no one comes before Him and lives, right? He's that God. And we see in Christ how he uh, was, was changed, the form, right, of God incarnate in Jesus, and yet we could embrace Christ and how God was accessible to us. And uh, the psalmist here just has wonderful conviction that regardless of what you're going through, we should come with an attitude of gratefulness. I heard this quote from a gentleman named Otto uh, Bolnow, if I said it right. He says in an essay, who really gives thanks? This is what the essay is titled. He poses a question, but he makes this statement. He says, There is hardly any other quality of man that is so suited to reveal the state of his inner spiritual and moral health as his capacity to be grateful. Now, we can agree or disagree with that. I think there's some, some insight and some wisdom there. How the, re- the reciprocal, right, of how our our greatness is, how grateful we are, kind of dictates or shows maybe kind of what we think about our life, about this world, about our situation, about God, His ability, His power, His might to intervene. And I think it's very important for us uh, to, to simply come back and realize you know, the, the Psalms and, and David and uh, uh, Paul, I mean, they were all convinced that you should come and give thanks Right with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, always giving thanks, as Paul would say, to the Lord. And the psalmist uh, here in a moment will read us saying, "Come, give thanks." All right, be reminded of who God is, and I think that's a challenge for us. I'm just going to say that you know sometimes we just simply forget. Sometimes we're, our eyes are so fixed upon the situation, the struggle, the pain that we forget who He is. A story of a pastor who was asked to come visit a church up north in a, in a winter, uh, in the, during the winter time to come and preach. And he arrived there, and the Sunday he was scheduled to preach, a, a blizzard had come in, and, the, and it was snowing outside, and one of the deacons came to him and apologized. I'm so sorry. Uh, this weather came in, it's snowing outside, and uh, we may not have a whole lot of people show up. And the pastor responded and said, man, as you're apologizing for the weather, I'm thanking God 
that he's faithful to his word, that the seasons come, and that as God says in Genesis 8, right, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, the day and night shall not cease. And if we looked upon the situation, one man sees, oh man, no one's going to show up. And the pastor says, God, you're faithful. You're faithful and you're good. So here's what the psalmist says, right? And there's some, some understanding of the greatness of God and what he's going to call you to do. And he says this. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all, the, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who, ha- excuse me, he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Let me offer a brief prayer. Lord, thank you. That's the word today, God. Thank you. Thank you for being who you are, for being constant, for being God. Thank you for creating us. I mean, maybe some of us might be struggling with that today. I don't know. But Lord, thank you for reason and purpose. That in the pain there's purpose because you are sovereign. You refine and, and grow your children. And we thank you that you are God. You are our shepherd. I pray this morning, Lord, that our eyes would be open to the truth of you. Lord, let your spirit come and teach us. Give us understanding, I pray. And Lord, allow me to be uh, out of the way. Let every thought in life be fixed upon you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's a little background to the the psalm. It has this drive. You know, the psalmist doesn't doesn't expand and, and, and go into a whole lot of detail. He's given us five verses, and he's very clear about who God is. He gives us uh, some names. He mentions God five times in five verses. He uses two names for God, uh, Jehovah, right, or or Yahweh in the Old Testament, and and, uh, Elohim. He mentions it twice, Elohim once and four times on the other. He's very clear on this is who he is, and because of who he is, right, you are to come and do something about it. He says some other things that you can, right, he can, and we can know him. That's very, very important. The psalmist believes that you can actually know God. That sounds like, like, like that's a kind of a day one thing, but you'll be, you'll be amazed at how many people think we can't understand him. Now, he's not saying we can know everything, right? The incomprehensibility of God, we cannot know everything. But what God has revealed, and the psalmist is, is convinced that we can look upon creation and know him as a creator, and we can look upon him as a redeemer, as a shepherd. We can see these things and the qualities of who God is. And we can know him for that. So the psalmist says, come with a loud shout and acknowledge God. Right? And so if our struggle here this morning, sometimes we live life, we kind of forget about all these things. Maybe you have felt, or maybe this thought has come through your mind, that God's got better things to do than to concern himself with me. Or you know, God has uh, you know, abandoned me. God has done something else. He's concerned about other people. I hear these great things God's done over there, but he never does anything for me. Well, the psalmist is going to deal with that. If that's been you or you've thought that before. And he comes, and this is my first point, and he's just simply bringing us, he reorients us back on who God is. And my first point is simply this. I said God is the song, right? God is the reason. God is the purpose. It's just God is. He is the I am, right? He just, he is. And I use the word song because we're called, right, to worship. And he says in the first two verses, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands, right, exclamation points. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. And what's amazing here is there is three imperative verbs, right? The imperative verb is a command. There are three commands the psalmist tells you to do right in these two verses. He's going to command us, number one, to make a joyful shout. Make. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Right? And the response, if God is the song, right, we are the worshipers. We are the singers. 
Right? This is his understanding. This is who God is. There is a response to this. And he says, come and make a joyful noise. Make a joyful noise. And you know, it's, it's a, kind of this interesting thing here that we, we simply come and, and the idea really has uh, this, this call to worship kind of feel to it. Right? He, he's saying to these Jews, and it's almost like the Jews are calling out the Gentiles, hey, depart from those false gods, those pagan gods, right? and come worship the true living God. It's an exhortation, right, to come, make a joyful shout. There's only one God. So how do we go about that? That's for us, right? How do we do this? Well, under your notes, I think I put letter A. It says, be thankful with a glad heart. We have to come and be thankful. And really, we could almost say, you know, be thankful in your proclamation, right? It's to proclaim him as part of the, of the, of the worship here. He says, make a joyful shout to the Lord all you lands it might sound strange to you that the word shout right come and shout i even purposely have been talking louder right <laughs> emphasizing shout come and make a shout but it's if you look kind of at this word what it's it kind of entails is the idea that if a king was though to to march by and parade and those would respond and and say yeah to the king it's kind of has that idea the psalmist kind of uh, in, in attaches to it and you know, come into his presence because he is the living God. He is true. Charles Spurgeon says, Our happy God should be worshipped by a happy people. A cheerful spirit is in keeping with his nature, his acts, and the gratitude which we should cherish for his mercies. His mercies. You know, I was... Um, often I, when I do my, my devotion time, I'll, I'll utilize some different things. I always read the Bible, but sometimes I'll read Puritan prayers. And I love Valley of the Vision. I'll, I'll reference that and, and use that. I love when Joel Beakey says, you know, use the, the Valley of Vision prayers as a catalyst to pray, right? And, and meaning that the Puritans would say, sometimes you just don't feel like praying. And so they would say, uh, pray until you pray, right? And sometimes, right? We've all, yeah, sometimes we don't feel like it. He said, we use that as a catalyst. And one of the prayers this last week I was reading through, and I was just marked by the thoughts that the Puritan had put out in saying, uh, you know, God's mercies. Today, God, you have felt and believed that I needed your mercies today. Right? Pause for a moment and think on this. If you're breathing, right? God believes, believes that you're in need and that you have access to his mercies today. That might sound like something we've said a thousand times. When you stop and think about it, the uniqueness, God's ability, His power, His might, and yet your very next breath, He's concerned about. Putting into that perspective, we come and, and we say, Man, Lord, thank you for your mercies with gratitude. See, sometimes we, we may think we have a hard time finding ways to worship God or finding reasons. And the psalmist says, hey, Guess what? He's God. That's enough, right? That's enough. But how much more does God do? How much more does He provide? The mercies, the breath, life, salvation, Christ, all of it. And so the psalmist says, come, right? Come with a shout. Right? Regardless of what you're going through this morning, God is constant. God is, is extending mercies. We may not know how it will work out. We trust in God's power and His might. And so it continues on. Right? He goes into the second part of, of, of uh, verse 2. It says, serve the Lord with gladness. And I put, be thankful with acts of service. It's an amazing. It says, you know, be, knowing God leads to some type, or proclamation of God leads to some type of action on our part, doesn't it? Right? And this is the second imperative. You are to serve. It's a command. There's a command for you to serve God, and this is an act of worship. Well, I don't know about you, but this kind of, I would look at verses, and I come to this, and I say, well, how do we go about this? How do, we, how do we worship God in acts of service? I believe Jesus gives wonderful insight to this. In Matthew 25, in verses 35 to 36, he says this, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Now, like all of us, I'd imagine, you know, if Jesus was in any of those uh, situations, we without hesitation would go to action. 
And so they're a little bit confused. You can imagine them scratching their heads here. And so they pose the question, right? The righteous, right? And Jesus says, well, then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when were you hungry and we fed you? Or thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison or come to you? There's our question, and then Jesus responds. And then the last verse of this passage, that's verse 40. He says, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So how are acts of worship, when the psalmist says, This is God, come to Him and proclaim that He is the true living God. Serve Him. How do we serve the Lord? We look at how Jesus has unfolded this for us. We see that there are a few things that we can do in very practical sense. Number one, we can thank God by feeding the hungry. We can glorify the Lord in this action, finding those in need. And in this process, we can glorify the Lord. Is this not an agreeable? What Jesus said, let the world see your good works and let them glorify your Father in heaven. We can go on through this passage. We can say we can welcome strangers. Right? We can have a heart of hospitality to those who are lonely. We can also clothe those who are lacking. We can care for those who are sick. We think about the different areas and ways in which we can minister to people of your community, those in your family, those you work with, the different areas where we can simply be the hands and feet of Christ and meet a very simple need. You know, it's quite different to come and help someone and then respond and say, why did you do this? You know, we could say, well, I'm commanded. It's an imperative verb in this one psalm, and we looked at it, right? Or we can simply say, you know, you have value. We believe God made every human being. You have value. How can I help you? Right? Very practical ways. And, of course, we can go to prison. Right? Those who are in prison develop a ministry that says, and God has hope. There's a better way. So there are very practical ways as we look at this. And the psalmist is saying, look, here's, here's the command. Come and proclaim this, this is God. Serve Him. In very practical ways we can do that. In the last part of verse 2, uh, he says, come before Him in His presence with singing. And this, I, I said, be thankful in formal worship. And here we have another imperative verb, another command to Come. Come. This, I believe, command deals with our demeanor, our attitude as we come together. We can approach Him with joy. I believe we, you know, salvation should have joy with it. David prayed in Psalms 51, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. But there's also a reverence right, for God, who He is. There should be a reverence for His house. Sometimes worship is full of praise and joy. Sometimes it's full of tears. It's always in order. And it's amazing as we look at this, I think, that we see this connection, right, between knowing, proclaiming, serving, right, something with, with knowing God and, and action of a sort, right? It's just not to be like, well, I worship. No, it involves knowledge. It involves action. It involves response. James Boyce, in this commentary, he says this, I am struck by the well-rounded nature of these terms. Shout, serve, and come. Those are our three imperatives. It says, for they embrace our verbal witness, our humanitarian activity, and worship. And he goes on, he says, three necessary parts of Christianity. Right there, in the middle of this short little psalm. right? Psalm 100. We see three acts. You know, it's amazing. It's not lost in the New Testament, of course. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, your whole life, all that you are is a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. It's your reasonable service, right? All that you are, all this knowledge, all this understanding, come and serve, come reverently and worship. And we see that in this passage, worship leads to some type of service, right? And true service is worship. A heart for God, being thankful for God, beginning to see, right, His hand, His goodness in everyday life. 
being an extension of that goodness to others and serving them and helping them, and realizing in these moments, my Heavenly Father, this God who is, is glorified. But sadly, as we notice at the beginning of this psalm, it is a call, isn't it? It is a call to come. It is a call to worship. But often today, right, the church is, um, many aren't responding to that call. So the psalmist yells this out, come, he is the, he's the God, he's it. Psalms 95, he is the rock of our salvation. Today, if you hear his words, do not harden your heart. And yet we see this, don't we? The call is going out and simply maybe out of disobedience, many disobey, won't come, right? We see the do not forsake, the assembling together in in Hebrews. Maybe often we could say, Mark, it would hit home harder with us. Maybe we're here, but maybe my heart just isn't in it. Maybe through worship you're doubting some of the truths we've sung. Maybe we question God's ability. All that is a challenge to us. And the psalmist is bringing us back and saying, regardless of what's happening in your life right now, God is constant. God is is good. God is true. And we may not see it. We may not see it, but you are commanded. I'm commanded. Come. Come reverently and worship. Serve. Use your gifts, your ability to make him known. Proclaim all that he is. Call others to come. He is the song. God is the song. God is the reason. God is the purpose. That's his understanding. He says, this is who he is. But he goes on, right? There's this call to worship. And he goes on in verse 3, in the first part of verse 3. I said, God is the creator, right? Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us. And not we ourselves. Right? We respond. He's the creator. We're his creation. This is another imperative verb. Right? You, you, man, he's hitting at something here, isn't he? No. That's a, that's a command. Know that the Lord, he is God. You are commanded to know him. What specifically are we to know about him? He is the creator. He is the one who made you. We are His, right? He formed your body. He placed a spirit, His breath inside of you. He is shaping you. He began the good work of redemption in you, and He's continuing that work. This is who He is. This is something we are called and commanded to know about Him. It's amazing how that truth, right, transcends. Paul, in Acts chapter 17, as he's dealing and he's, he's engaging in apologetics and working these things out, and he comes across and he quotes one of the the Greek's own poets and says, even one of your own poets has said, in him we live and breathe and have our being. And Paul says, that's actually correct, but you're you're not worshiping the true living God. He is the one in him you live and move and have your being. He is the one who is the source of all life. He is the creator, God. And what did God create you for? Fellowship with him. Know him, to enjoy him, to enjoy him for not just in this life or in moments of difficulty, but for eternity. Think about that. The God who, is, who spoke and created wants to know you. And he wants, more importantly, for you to know him. Think on that for a moment. Conversations we can have, right? Matthew Henry said this, he has... An incontestable right, speaking of God, who has a right to and a property in us and all things. His we are to be actuated or used by his power, disposed of by his will, and devoted to his honor and glory. That's who he is. So the psalmist says, look, you're commanded to come. You're commanded to, to come into his, his presence with reverence. You're commanded to serve. You're, 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 man, proclaim him, right? Make him known with a loud shout. And he gives us the reason, right? There's something we are to know about this wonderful, awesome God. It's an intelligent understanding. You know something true. You know, going back to Acts 17, when Paul's dealing with these Greeks and he's engaging them. The confusion that is there, right? They even have one idol to the what? The unknown God. So we cover all our bases here. 
uh, we've got all these, and then let's just put them all, the ones we're not sure of, let's just put them in this category. Well, Paul talks about it, right? Acts 70 says this, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. That's true of our day to day. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. They don't have no idea who he is. What is Paul going to begin to do? Therefore, the one in whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Let me give you understanding. This true living God. Let me give you insight. Let me show you and teach you who this is. Right? And the psalmist is convinced. He said this uh, four times. He's used the word Jehovah. For Lord, right? In your Bible, it says Lord in there. It is the self-existent or eternal God. Then he uses Elohim together. Lord and God. He's the supreme one, right? So he uses these names to make sure we're not talking about just anybody, right? He covers that basis. This is who he is. And you are to know that this God, the self-existing one, the supreme God has made you. And we not ourselves. He has made you. There's something wonderful here, I think. There's something that necessarily happens. See, the more you know about God, the more you learn about yourself, don't you? The more we learn about ourselves, the more we learn about who God is. Calvin touched on that at the beginning of his institutes, and here it is. The psalmist is saying the very same thing. You are to come and serve, and you are to know something about this God, and it leads to action. Jonathan Edwards said this in his book on true religious affection. He says, men will trust in God no further than they know him. And they cannot be in the exercise of faith in him one ace further than they have a sight of his fullness and faithfulness in exercise. And the extent of how much you know him, right, will be the reciprocal of how much you follow him, how much you worship him him so the psalmist is convinced this is something that we need to know you need to know you're commanded to know god is the creator and so we have to ask what happens if we don't know him as creator i'm sure you can fill in the blank here pretty quickly right it's we can imagine uh, ourselves as the creator isn't it there's a void there. We usually put our, our foot down, right? That's, that's where I belong. If God is not the creator, then typically we will do this. We've done this in our society, right? Scientifically. We've said, well, let's just take this theory of evolution, right? And say, let's just get, it does away with God. And we don't need God. Uh, well, we don't need to be thankful for him, right? So therefore, religion and all this is debunked. We don't need any of it. Now, a side note, not in my notes, but you just have to know if you're if you're holding to evolution, uh, that's a bucket full of holes. It really is. Even secular scientists are now coming out and saying, you know what, uh, intelligent design is a viable option. I think on that for a moment. Secularists, right, those who have denied and held to uh, uh, evolution are coming out and saying, you know what, it, it just doesn't hold any water anymore. Intelligent, they're not claiming Christianity, right? They're not going to go that far, right? That's going to take a work of the Spirit, but they're going to say intelligent design. But this is what happens. We take God and we say, you know what? If he's not the creator, something else is going to be there and we're going to fill that with ourselves. And if we don't fill it with ourselves, we're definitely going to fill it with our own abilities, right? Our own gifts, our own achievements. It's like this statement, right? A self-made man who worships his creator. Think on that. A self-made man who worships his creator, right? That's the circle. That's what happens. There's a quote from Julian Huxley. He said this. He was a committed evolutionary humanist. He said, man's most sacred duty and at the same time his most glorious opportunity is to promote the maximum fulfillment of the evolutionary process on this earth. And this includes the fullest realization of his own inherent possibilities. When God is out of the picture, right? Definitely man is going to puff himself up. So the psalmist is, is right coming back and saying, this is what you're to know about him. He is the creator. Not only is he the song, 
Not only to see the reason. Not only that, but you need to know. You're commanded to know He is the Creator. And you, not yourself. You did not create yourself. So we see this in a broad sense, the, the, the Creator, and then he, he goes a little bit further and makes it much more relational, doesn't he? In this last part of verse 3, he says, We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. God is the shepherd. It's not just that He created you. It's not enough for God to create you. It's not enough for Him to give you mercies every day. It's not enough to give you good things, take care of you and breath. Right? And by His grace, we are what we are. We see His activity. It's not enough to save you. It's not enough for God. God will be your shepherd. He will lead us. So our response to the shepherd is exactly that. We are His sheep. We are His people. The sheep of His pasture. David definitely picked up on this. Psalms 23, maybe that floated into your mind. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want understood this picture. God doesn't abandon us. He doesn't leave us. Listen to the words of Jesus in John chapter 10 to get a picture of this good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep and am known by my own. You can hear the psalm resonating there, right? Know him. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. There's a wonderful picture for us. We are his sheep. He is the good shepherd. We have a savior who will not lead you to troubled waters, but to calm waters, to green pastures. Again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, remember we've talked about this. You have been bought at a price. The good shepherd has laid down his life for you. He's died for you. He's gone in your place. And if there's no other reason to be thankful, right? Here it is. God is the song. God is the creator. God is the shepherd. He's the redeemer. He has made you. He has saved you. He has redeemed you. He continues to walk with you. He continues to lead you. It's not enough for him to just make you. What does that tell you about God? It's not enough just to make you. He will save us as well. It says in verse 3, right? We are not ourselves. If we take those names, God is creator and redeemer, and we think about what does it actually mean that God is creator and redeemer and we are not ourselves. Well, it simply means that if, if you're enjoying a level of prosperity, if you're enjoying God's blessing and peace in that sense, then we should stop and say, God, thank you. Thank you for your goodness, your mercy. Thank you for your grace today. You know, on the other side of that, it also means if you're going through trials and sorrows, our response is thankfulness, gratitude, that even in the midst of this, God has not left me. God will not depart from me. Paul got a hold of this in Philippians chapter 4 when he says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned. Whatever state I am, to be, con- to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound everywhere and, and in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So that changes when we stop and realize that Paul wrote that in a prison cell. And the letter is full of thanksgiving, thanking God for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we come to this and we realize he's the creator, he's the redeemer. And we have to pause and think on this for a moment, right? What does it mean that you and I, we are his sheep, we are his people. It means that no matter what is going on in your life today, he is yours. We are his. 
There's never a moment where he'll abandon you or walk away from you. There's never a moment, whether there be sickness to come, we are his. Whether we lose a job, we get a job, we are his. If there is a death in the family or some type of tragedy, we know he doesn't leave you. Think for a moment on this. God the Father has said, Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Jesus, God the Son says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Holy Spirit, the promise of Him is the guarantee, Ephesians 1.14, the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. We see all three of the Trinity at work in holding your life and, and sustaining our life and walking with us. He's not just the song. He's not just the creator. He's not just the shepherd. He's the redeemer who says, you know what, even though I've, I've redeemed you and I saved you, I'll never depart from you, regardless of what you're going through. The highs, the lows, God is a constant. He is the rock of our salvation. This is who he is. And for him to not be this, he ceases to be God. The psalmist has hold of this. He's understanding all of this, and he's calling you to say, come, right? Make a joyful shout. This is who God is. Give acts of service. Come in reverence. This is God. It's a story of a little girl who was at a, a, a job fair of sorts. There's an elementary girl walking with her class, and they're looking at different things and learning different things about the community. And she went to this one table, and it was about safety, and she was answering these questions. And one of the questions was, well, who must look out for our safety? It was a simple question. She, without hesitation, wrote the word God. A few people listening to her, she spoke out loud as she answered the question, chuckled, but there was one who teared up. Thinking and wishing, I just simply had that kind of faith. You know, too often, and I know I don't want to make light of any problems or stresses, and I don't ever want to do that. I'm human too. But too often we focus on those things and we question the God who's created everything. When our response to, to life is to know God. God has this. I'm not just anybody. I'm the sheep of his pasture. He knows me. He knows my name. I'm identified by his name, just as you are. This is who he is. So until the church, until you and I understand that, that when everything is gone and all we have is God, we'll have everything we've ever needed. It's God. In five verses, the psalmist mentions his name five times. He tells us, he commands us, come and realize what you have in God. Realize the creator, realize the, the redeemer, the shepherd who leads our lives. I think of Psalm 95. I just read in our scripture reading. Today, if you hear his truth, do not harden your heart. Don't let trials pains, problems, keep you from coming, saying, despite this, God, you are constant. I am yours. I am in the hand of the Savior, and no one can pluck me from his hand. Let's live and worship with that confidence. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. And we know our words this fall so miserably short just how awesome you are, how precious you are, how beautiful you are. And Lord, we confess, oftentimes that's not on the tip of our tongue. Often it's, it's there's this life, the situations of life. So Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for, for maybe looking to you last when we should have been looking to you first. But Father, I also pray, and I pray for each and every one of us here this morning that as we live this life, as we work through all these, these situations, that the struggles, they are real. And give us faith. Give us faith, Lord, to see and to know that you're at work. Remind us, Lord, often that we are yours. We belong to you. Christ has purchased us. 
we are redeemed. Help us to be mindful, Lord, that, that it's not just this life, it's eternity. Let us be reminded that you desire to have fellowship, to be known, that we would know you and what you have revealed in your word. And Lord, for the joys and the sorrows, uh, the moments on the mountaintop and the valleys, God, give us eyes that see your hands and your goodness. Let us be reminded you are God. With tears, Lord, let us be reminded you are God. You are constant. You know our name. And you will never, ever forsake us or forget about us. Thank you for that confidence. Thank you for that peace. I pray, Lord, you would continue to glorify yourself in us and in your church. We love you. We thank you. We pray this all in the wonderful, beautiful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.